I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we analyse updates from the front lines, bring you the latest diplomatic news around the world, and we discuss Ukraine's tough new policy on medical exemptions from military duty. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 6th of September, one year and 195 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. Let's start in chronological order. I think chronological order, but anyway. So last night, Russia launched a missile attack across Kiev in the early hours of this morning. And the city's military administration said their air defence systems had shot down all the missiles before reaching their targets. This comes from Sergei Popko, who's the head of Kiev's uh, military administration there. He was putting a message on Telegram. He said, another missile attack by the enemy on a peaceful city with the aim of killing the civilian population and destroying the infrastructure. He added that at the moment, or the, and the last thing I saw, no uh, no casualties and no widespread destruction, as in... Obviously, things are going to be damaged when they when this stuff comes down, but they haven't, haven't detonated and destroyed too done too much damage. Also, in the early uh, early hours of today, drone strikes in Odessa region killed at least one person. This comes from the regional governor. The attack overnight lasted three hours, targeted the port and agricultural infrastructure in the Ismail district. This is from Ole Keeper. He's again on Telegram, the regional governor. Now you'll remember the Danube River port of Ismail is the border between Romania, NATO member Romania, and uh, and Ukraine. That's become a main export route for Ukrainian products, basically, since Russia pulled out of the grain deal in July. It's from there. Things are mainly mainly sent by road, and I covered that. I sp- spoke a little bit about that in last week's Defence in Depth, about actually getting the grain out and then um, further away from Europe uh, aids the, uh, the effort or rather, if they if it stays in Europe, it brings the price down and upsets neighbours such as Poland. So the more that can be got out by road and sent further afield, then it, it helps just shore up that little area of the um, of the alliance, soft A alliance that Russia had been targeting. Now let's go down to the southwest of the country, back to the the area of the main offensive here, the ongoing offensive from uh, from Ukraine. And uh, interestingly, for the first time, a Russian appointed official has acknowledged that Russian forces have abandoned the village of Robotine. So this is about a week after Kiev said it had recaptured the, the village. So Yevgeny Belitsky, who's the he's the Moscow installed official in Zaporizhia, or in the Zaporizhia region, he was in a on a Russian television interview. And he said that the army had withdrawn for what, what, what he called tactical reasons. So he said, quote, the Russian army abandoned, tactically abandoned, this settlement because staying on a bare surface when there is no way to completely dig in doesn't generally make sense. Therefore, the Russian army moved off to the hills. OK, so he cor- rapidly corrected himself there and said tactically abandoned. But his point there about um, about what, what, what doesn't make sense, I would suggest staying on a bare surface does make sense if you are the most powerful dog on that surface and you have the best weapons, the best tactics, best motivation. I mean, ask any sailor. That is effectively what naval warfare is all about. Okay, you've got the big blue wobbly stuff, but essentially it's flat um, in terms of what you can see and where the air meets the water and all that kind of jazz. So it's effectively a bare surface. Look at the Battle of Kursk in the Second World War. Massive, massive tank battle that was has been likened to a, a sea battle because it's just so bare-arsed and flat. Um, that it's all down to tactics, motivation, and who's got the, the the most stuff. So you know it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you have to move if, if there's a bare area. It's just as hard for the other side as it is for you. You've just got to turn it to your advantage. But hey, you know he's he, of course he's got to try and suggest that this was all all part of the plan. You wouldn't expect otherwise, but I disagree with him there. Now Russia has not. Um, had not previously acknowledged the loss of Robotine. Ukraine said they'd t- taken it on August the 28th. 
And in its daily update today, the Russian Defense Ministry said that its forces had repelled two Ukrainian attacks near the area. So they're not talking about it. So I think it's quite interesting that, that Mr. Bolitsky did say that. Maybe he'll have to row back on that in the next 24 hours. It's still obviously a very, very hard fight. Alexander Sursky, who's the commander of Ukraine's ground forces, said the situation along the whole of the eastern front line remains very difficult. And the main task for Ukraine's troops is to is just to hold the line right now. He said uh, the enemy does not abandon his plans to reach the borders of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Our main task is to ensure reliable defence, to prevent the loss of our strongholds and positions in the Kupiansk and Liman directions, that's further to the north, as well as to successfully move forward and reach the designated lines in the Bakhmut direction. Right, OK, it's very difficult to accurately plot Russian um, defensive belts, where they start, where they stop, and how to account for all the other positions that are covering those fortifications. I mean, as I've said many times, all defences should be covered by view and fire, surveillance assets and preferably humans and fire. We think Ukraine is through the first obstacle belt. I was in a, a briefing earlier on today with uh, with Western officials and the, the consensus is that Ukraine has broken through that first obstacle belt. The Western official described the fighting there as a PhD in land warfare to give an idea of, of what we're asking, or what is expected of, of Ukraine's forces to go from having no real credible combined arms capability to having a go at one of the hardest land operations possible. But Western official was saying Russia is thought to be now at 50% of the combat power it had in February last year. That's the the combat power, as in land combat power, obviously Navy, Air Force, much lower. 50% of combat power, that's not a bad return of investment, especially when you're talking to um, political leaders about how much they should support the war with money and, and equipment. Not a bad return on in investment for, for Ukraine doing all the fighting. We also think Russia has lost about a third of the 300 or so Ka-52 attack helicopters. Again, that's a phenomenal number to lose a third of, of that military capabilities just staggering there's also i'd point you to an article in the guardian on sunday who quotes brigadier general alexander Ter, um, Ter, ternevsky who's the general leading the southern counteroffensive, who says he was saying that russia is thought to have devoted 60 percent of its time and resources into building that first offensive line and only 20 percent each into the second and third because moscow was not expecting ukrainian forces to get through now, he was also saying that the forces are between the first and second lines. So that's I think we should I think we should take that as a working assumption. That now seems to be, as I say, the squad average compared today or included today with the um, comments from the Western officials. So as we said before, we don't know how much how many personnel there are going to be in those other lines. They may be just as formidable as the first line of Russian defence. But if you're not if you've not got the people there to accurately bring in fire or to say what the Ukrainians are doing if they do something slightly different, then it's it's a that that is very significant. Now let's stay in the southwest in the area of Rebove. That's um, the area of the, the biggest advance in the Ukrainian attack. And we think Ukrainian troops have likely so this is coming from the ISW, Institute for the Study of War, likely pinned down some of Russia's elite troops in the area, preventing them from redeploying west to to plug the gap that, that Ukraine is forcing. So I say this comes from ISW, who are citing a Russian mill blogger, one of the one of the more reliable, soft R, reliable mill, Russian mill bloggers, who was commenting on an, an audio recording from a Russian soldier. Now, we think about 50 soldiers from the 7th VDV, VDV being the airborne airborne troops, arguably, well, at the start line last year, the better quality troops. They're probably no longer there or not in any any sort of numbers, but the VDV, airborne forces, taken to be the better grade of, as in better soldiers, Not don't, don't start on the morals, but as in being a soldier, which obviously there's a huge dose of morality in being a soldier. But anyway, not going to tie myself up in knots. But anyway, the VDV, airborne forces, thought to be pretty good. 7th VDV lost about 50 soldiers killed in action in one day of fighting near the village of Staromayorsk. You may remember that was taken about a month ago. This is on the um, down in the south on the, the sort of the second of those two axes heading southeast towards Mariupol, that kind of area. Reports are that the bodies were left where they fell, weren't recovered. ISW said 
The Ukrainian counteroffensive operations in the Donetsk Zaporizhia Oblast border area are likely succeeding in pinning elements of the 7th Guards Mountain Airborne Division and preventing them from laterally redeploying, that's moving, to critical areas of the front in the western Zaporizhia Oblast. Now, it's thought that Russia has already pulled the 76th Guards Air Assault Division from the eastern front around Klishkiva, that's 5 k south of Bakhmut, to reinforce the area around uh, Robertina and Verbove. The 76th are held responsible for the Butcher massacres at the start of the full-scale invasion. They've seen months of fighting around Bakhmut, but they are thought to still be the best formation, so a a large body of, of fighting forces, thought to be about the best Russia has left and one of the few big formations capable of offensive action. So if they've been moved, then that is very significant. And just finally, just something from yesterday that I think came in after we'd after we'd done the pod, but there were reports yesterday that Russian forces had shot down a Ukrainian drone in a village near where Putin has a, a residence. So the Russian Defence Ministry said air defences had brought down a, a UAV, un, uninhabited air vehicle, in the Tver region, that's northwest of Moscow. MASH, a Russian media outlet, said the drone was destroyed in Zavidovo, which is about 75 k's northwest of, of Moscow, um, near where Putin has a hunting lodge. Sergei Sobyanin, Moscow's mayor, said there was no indication Putin was at the property at the time, and he said there were no casualties and that two other drones had been shot down early yesterday morning near the capital. I'll take a pause there, David. Thanks very much, Dom Nichols. Francis, can we turn to you? There's been quite a few interesting political and strategic updates. Can you talk us through them? Well, thanks, David. The major news this morning in the political realm is that Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, has arrived in Kyiv for a visit. Footage shows Mr Blinken being greeted by the usual fanfare, which also included Patron, a detection dog awarded the Ukrainian Order of Courage last year for locating an apparently diffusing unexploded ordnance left behind by Russian troops. Quite how a dog can diffuse ordnance, I don't know, but apparently he found 236 such devices. Sounds terrifying to me. Anyway, Mr. Blinken's two-day trip marks the first to Kyiv by a top US official since the Ukrainian counteroffensive began, and he will meet with President Zelensky and Foreign Minister Kuleba, among with other senior officials, as well as civil society figures later today. Secretary of State is also expected to announce a new package of US assistance worth more than $1 billion, a senior State Department official has told reporters, though we don't yet know the details of that. I imagine we'll hear that tomorrow or on Friday. As is so often the case, several hours before the arrival, as Dom has mentioned, Russia carried out airstrikes on Kyiv and the southern region of Odessa. No casualties were reported in the capital, but a civilian was killed and poor infrastructure damaged in the south, as Dom was saying. So just again, always Russia targets those places where major officials will be visiting to make to drum home this point that the war is far from over and Russia is still capable of doing so. Staying in Ukraine, Ukraine's parliament has just approved Zelensky's nomination of Umarov as Kyiv's new new defence minister after the resignation of Reznikov. He posted a photograph of the voting board showing 338 out to 360 lawmakers voting in favour of the nomination. For those who want to learn more about him and the resignation of Reznikov, I would recommend that they check out the episode we did on Monday, where we were joined by former Ukrainian MP and friend of the podcast, Aliona Halivko, where we talked about the pair of them in detail. Elena Zelenska, the first lady of Ukraine, has recently given an interview in the last 24 hours where she spoke about the enormous emotional toll that the war has taken on her family and offers insights into the complex security procedures in place to protect them. We don't live together with any husband. Sorry, I, we don't live together with my husband. The family is separated, she told the BBC. We have the opportunity to see each other, but not as often as we would like. My my son misses his father, but we stay strong. We have strength both emotionally and physically, and I'm sure we will handle it together. At the outset of Russia's invasion, of course, Mrs. Zelenska spent months in hiding in secret locations along with her children. But as the war has dragged on, she has turned her attention to meeting foreign leaders and delivering speeches abroad in a bid to drum up support to Kyiv. She has become, I would argue, a key asset for the Ukrainian cause on the diplomatic circuit. 
But turning away from Ukraine, a notable story from here in the UK that the Wagner Group of Mercenaries is to be prescribed as a terrorist organisation, putting it on par with ISIL and Al-Qaeda. Prescription will make it a criminal offence to belong to Wagner, attend its meetings, encourage support for it or carry its logo in public, similar to said other terrorist groups. Suella Braveman, the British Home Secretary, has said, and I quote, Wagner is a violent and destructive organisation which has acted as a military tool of Putin's Russia overseas. While Putin's regime decides what to do with the monster it created, Wagner's continuing destabilising activities only continue to serve the Kremlin's political goals. They are terrorists, plain and simple. And this prescription order makes that clear in UK law. Wagner has been involved in looting, torture and barbarous murders. Its operations in Ukraine, the Middle East and Africa are a threat to global security. That is why we are prescribing this terrorist organisation and continuing to aid Ukraine wherever we can in its fight against Russia. Offences under the ban will carry a jail term of up to 14 years, we understand. It also means that Wagner's assets and finances can be categorised as terrorist property and seized. It will also have implications for Wagner's ability to raise money if any funds went through financial institutions in Britain. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's rather like closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. But better late than never, I suppose. And as I say, it will have some major implications. Of course, the future of the group, said to still number around 25,000, remains uncertain after Prigozhin and his inner circle died in the plane crash. Its battle-tested fighters are said by some to be too valuable to be disbanded and just let go. Observers say that it is unclear if the Kremlin will try to preserve Wagner under new management or create fully-fledged replicas. Suffice to say, we will be keeping an eye on that. Moving away from Europe, an odd story this one. Cuba has uncovered a human trafficking ring that has coerced its citizens to fight for Russia in Ukraine, its foreign ministry has said, adding that Cuban authorities were working to neutralise and dismantle the network. So the statement from Cuba's foreign ministry gave few details, but noted the trafficking ring was operating both within the Caribbean island nation, thousands of miles from Moscow and in Russia. So I'll quote from that. The Ministry of the Interior is working on the neutralisation and dismantling of a human trafficking network that operates from Russia to incorporate Cuban citizens living there and even some from Cuba into the military forces participating in war operations in Ukraine. The Russian government has not commented on these allegations, but last year, of course, it announced a plan to boost the size of its armed forces by more than 30% to 1.5 million combat personnel. A lofty goal made harder by its heavy but as yet undisclosed casualties in the war. In late May, I think it was, a Russian newspaper in Rizan City reported that several Cuban citizens had signed contracts with Russia's armed forces and had been shipped to Ukraine in return for Russian citizenship. It's not immediately clear if the Cuban foreign ministry statement was associated with the Rizan report, but Cuba's government said it has already begun prosecuting cases in which its citizens had been coerced into fighting in Ukraine. Knowing the Russian eagerness to recruit soldiers from outside major urban areas such as Moscow and St. Petersburg, it does stand to reason that they would do this. And as I say, we will be looking into it in more detail because it is a fascinating story. Thanks very much, Francis. Before we move on, Dom Nichols, I know you want to come back on a few of those points. So the Wagner thing, yes, better late than never. never. You could have done this a while ago, but I mean, it is a little bit of diplomatic housekeeping i suppose but of course wagner continues to be an entity russia i mean it's much diminished i, I don't think it's going to get back to anything like what it was under prigozhin and ukin anytime soon if ever but it is still an entity it is a brand russia will use that even though the fighters have probably all got or had signed contracts and they're now part of russia's um, mod proper but i think i think the kremlin will use it as a brand especially overseas where they continue to act as a um, a, a great sort of business venture, gold and, and what have you, particularly across Africa, but also elsewhere, mining concessions and so on and so forth. So the Wagner name will still be out there. But by prescribing them like this, it does send a message from the British government to any world leaders who might be thinking of employing them or allowing them to operate from their soil that you know it does that is that decision will not come without consequences. So so yes, part, partly I think it is it is late. 
but also it is it is still very much a live issue so i don't i don't think it's it's wrong that it's uh well it's not wrong that it's happened it's not it's not a, it's, it's not a meaningless gesture even if it is a little bit late i think that was about it wasn't it Dave? was there anything else that you wanted me to talk about just very quickly on Patch on the Dog, just to be a little clear about how exactly the how exactly a dog can help when we're finding munitions and defusing them. Well, yeah, I mean they they sniff it out and um, and then they point or they sit down or they get very excited and um, I mean they can't defuse the bomb. Sounds themselves. like David. Well, quite yes. Uh, <laughs> the dogs can't defuse the bomb clearly. No opposable thumbs, but they can let us know where they uh, where they are. We used spaniels in in the army. They're amazing things, just so excitable. But would then go very still and sit down if they saw or, or sniffed something that that was of interest. And then if it's for other people to go and to go and deal with whatever was there. I mean, a real tight bond between the animal and and the operator. We lost a a team on my my tour in Afghanistan. We lost a. Um, a, a dog handler and the uh, and the dog the next day. I mean, it's really, yeah, it's obviously you ne- never. You're always sad with every every loss, but this is particularly galling to see that because of the tight bond between uh, between the animal and and the troops. I mean, it's very controversial using animals in war. There's a big um, monument to animals in war here in London on, at the north end of of um, Pall Mall. Not Pall Mall. Sorry, I want to talk about uh, not by Hyde Park Corner. <laughs> On uh, yeah, uh, Hyde Park. Sorry, that's it. Not Pall Mall. I'm getting your gentlemen's clubs all mixed up. But um, yeah, so animals in war very very controversial because obviously they don't, they don't get a vote, but they do do what comes naturally to them. They are given every encouragement. They are trained and loved and get to do what they are, they are best at. So you know it is it is tricky. I mean it's a discussion possibly for another another time because it's it's very. Um, it, there is much more to be said about it on on every side, but yeah, essentially the animal doesn't get to choose what it's doing, and some of them lose their lives. But yeah, they are, are hugely beneficial to um, to military service. All ever since yeah, we talk about horses and camels and all the rest of it, but um, carrier pigeons also used in the Second World War. We use horses in in Bosnia. I mean, we even used horses in in Afghanistan. Have a look at the movie Twelve Strong. That will tell you how horses are used very um, uh, to great effects in very modern very re- recent times so dogs yeah still very much in, in military service uh, today and uh, and operational and you do occasionally lose a few unfortunately well thanks very much for that dom francis can i come back to you uh, to lead on this story there's been a it's it's a really interesting story in the economists and it warrants a bit of discussion can you give us the gist of it and then i know dom wants to come in on this as well Sure. Well, it's called Inside Ukraine's Assassination Programme and very simply looks in detail at how Ukraine has struck out against its enemies at home and abroad. It describes the operation that saw the assassination of the mayor of Veliky Burlok in the Kharkiv region, who was identified as a collaborator with the Russians. A special forces commander and a group of local officers were apparently given the job, according to the article, and his men watched their target meticulously for days where he shopped, when and where he moved, the extent of his security. And once they detonated their bomb from a distance, they disappeared to safe houses inside occupied territory. The group would return to the territory only weeks later after the town had been liberated and the body of the mayor has never been found. The article says there have been dozens of such assassinations. They quote General Bunadov when he says, if you're asking about creating a version of Mossad, we don't need to. It already exists. And it says Ukraine's president is understood to authorise the most controversial operations, though other decisions are delegated. The Economist quotes a high-level government source with knowledge of the work, but declines to discuss the details. They say, and I quote, it's important not to comment or even think about such operations. But as Zelensky has issued a clear order to avoid collateral damage among civilians... The president communicates this instruction to people formally and on occasion by shouting at them, apparently. Ukraine had to choose its targets carefully, the source adds, and it might not always have done so. Regular listeners will recall how Ukraine's leadership came under particular scrutiny in October last year when the Americans blamed Kyiv for a car bomb that killed Daria Dugina, daughter of Alexander Dugin, the nationalistic philosopher who advocated for genocide against Ukrainians. The article says, and I quote, that event sharpened an already lively internal debate within Ukrainian intelligence. A subsequent string of operations targeting mid-level propagandists showed a trend that few of the insiders interviewed for this article were happy with. 
These were marginal figures, said one source in counterintelligence. It makes me uncomfortable. The former officer suggests the operations were designed to impress the president rather than bring victory any closer. Clowns, prostitutes and jokers are a constant around the Russian government, he said. Kill one and another will appear immediately in their place. There is also a concern that such operations risk exposing sources, of course, methods and the extent of Ukrainian infiltration into Russia. The source says our security services shouldn't do things just because they can. As I say, David, it's a very interesting read and I'm only giving the gist there. It goes into a lot more detail on particular specifics of operations. But as you say, I know Dom has some thoughts on this. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Francis, for giving us the overview there. Well, Dom, you wrote your, you were telling us earlier, you wrote your master's dissertation on targeted assassinations. What's your take on this story from The Economist? Yeah, I think it's a fascinating story worth worth a look and, and an area to be explored because this gets right to the heart of what we've been talking about for the last year and a half, really. Military service, killing, murder, all the rest of it, and where you draw the line. And assassination has never really been... Uh, in the in the purview of the military as such because it's not it's not always been that possible let me explain that i mean we we start with the start from the standpoint that killing is wrong that's kind of that's the um the i know liberal democratic idea killing is wrong except in self defense obviously but of course the state does carve out for itself areas where where killing is not wrong so law enforcement military action some countries still have capital punishment. You can debate the rights and wrongs of all these things, but there are some areas where the state says, actually, it is lawful for me to kill you. Now, in the military arena, that goes a stage further. The military are allowed to take life, uh, including collateral damage. So those that in the innocent civilians is a, is a phrase sometimes used. I don't particularly like the phrase, but, you know, collateral damage is a bit wonky, but... When we, what we mean by that is people you, you don't intend to you don't intend to kill, and that's obviously subject to certain constraints that the action must be legal, proportionate, necessary, must be properly planned, and authorized, and so on and so forth. But the military is allowed is legally allowed to take life, including collateral damage, not just to people trying to kill them, but by dint of the position those folk are in, i.e., if they're in the military, they therefore pose a threat to the lives of our service personnel in the future because of the roles they are likely to undertake. And the argument is, therefore, I can target you now for an action that you will probably take in the future. That's why you are now targetable and I have I reserve myself the legal right to kill you. Now, you can take that a stage beyond this. Now, Al Qaeda did this. Many terrorist groups do. Russia, you can argue, has done. And that is by taking the argument into saying, well, you, Western society, this democratic society, you have elected the people who are making the decision to invade country X, Y, to go to war and so on and so forth. Therefore, I hold you accountable for that. And I think you are targetable. So this is what, as I say, Al-Qaeda, most explicitly Russia to a certain degree, but it's all similar moral territory, saying... I can kill anybody I like because you are just as much to blame. I don't, Al-Qaeda, very open about it, clearly, as many as are, ISIS and so on and so forth. But Russia explains away all these bombs on pizza restaurants by saying, well, you know, there were some military people in there talking. They were discussing military plans. So it was a military, albeit for that brief time, it was a military headquarters. Therefore, it's entirely targetable. I can I can do what I like. I mean, it's utter hogwash and it doesn't stand up anywhere. But that's the kind of territory you're in. So... So there's very much, very definitely three kind of areas, self-defense, then legally being able to take life. And then that third area of saying, I'm blaming everybody for this position. So I so I, I reserve myself the right to kill you. So it, it is a, there are different ways, different areas we should think about this. I'm not telling you what to think, but this is how I would suggest we should think about it, the framework with which to have these debates. And then you talk about the, the capability. So it's, it's very difficult to target individual people. It has been up to now. We've seen these videos of drones being dropped on individual trench positions and soldiers and tanks and, and what have you. So it is now becoming more possible and personal. But you arguably don't get any more personal than a targeted assassination, whereby you, you pick your target, you research that target, where they're going to be, you choose your moment of that you're going to take action, and arguably the more effort that you put into it, then 
the least ground you will be given in terms of if anybody else is caught up in that. If there was any collateral damage and in a court of law later on, you're shown to have watched that target for months and known his or her movements to the exact minute that they come out of the house, get in the car and drive to work. Then they'll say, well, why did you set the bomb off when they're at the busy junction of 45th Street and Main or whatever? Just getting into my Americanism for the for next week. But, you know, so so targeted assassination puts a greater responsibility, you could argue, on the on those that are then going to carry out that that action. And, you know, it doesn't it shouldn't necessarily be thought of as a as a a separate moral area, provided the target is a legitimate target. And again, huge legal territory here about what's legitimate, what's proportionate and so on and so forth. But. Now, provided it's a legitimate military target, then you don't get any more precise. And we like precision, precision guard munitions. We like, we like to try and remove the, uh, the threat to others who aren't necessarily to be targeted. So you don't get any more precise than eyeballing the person you're going after and killing them. I mean, it's grim stuff. It really is. But ultimately, this is what you expect men and women to do. And it is a bit of a moral fudge to say, well, actually, you know, what? I'd prefer if you just stayed a few hundred kilometers back and bunged a few missiles. I'd feel better about that. No, if you want this to be precise and you don't want children and other people to be killed who, who are not targetable, then ultimately you do want precise military assassinations. This came into... The reason I looked into this for my dissertation was that I... I was rather struck by, you may remember the the action that was alleged to have been by Mossad, the Israeli spy agency, when a number of operatives were dressed up as tennis players and they went to Dubai to kill a, a member of, of a Palestinian terrorist organisation. And they did it under British and Australian passports. Now, Jack Straw, who was the Labour Foreign Secretary at the time, kicked off and said, this is outrageous, using British passports, blah, blah, blah. But he didn't actually criticise the act didn't criticise the targeting of it, which might have been a diplomatic nicety, but actually he was probably correct, I think, in in the moral stance there. He was going on about how it was was not fair to do on British passports. But this was, that was a a targeted assassination. The research had gone in. Only the person that was identified as the target and had been cleared was attacked and killed. So you could argue that whilst it is a bit grim and it is very personal, that is what you would ultimately want your military forces to be able to do if you so wish now i've skirted over a whole load of issues there there's a twenty-five thousand word dissertation if anyone's particularly interested that you can dig into all this sort of stuff but it is worth thinking about because it's live and we're having to deal with it every day and it's very easy to feel conflicted on this about when it is legal and not legal to take life it's easy for other people to claim that they reserve themselves the right to take life when they, when there is none. And you'll hear a lot of people shouting from every side. So we, again, all we try and do here on the pod is, is talk about the armour we have, the, the framework with which to, to receive this information and then make your own minds up. So, yeah, have a think about all the stuff I said there. And, yeah, as, as I say, as pretty grim as it, as it is to actually go out and specifically say, I am going to kill you, not you generally, the 76th Guards division or whatever but you to an individual it is grim but it is the most precise action you can take it's up to the individual who's going to carry out that act at the last moment to think for him or herself actually you know what they don't look like the photograph i'm not sure this is him right call it off you have that possibility so as weapons get more precise and as we expect men and women to go into harm's way arguably to do this sort of thing we need to arm ourselves with the arguments about how to think about it so we can have a better discussion. Thank you very much, Dom, for t- taking us through your thoughts there. Francis, do you want to add uh, just a, a few brief thoughts to that and then we'll go to our final story? Well, Dom's dissertation sounds a bit more interesting than mine, which was on the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. I did actually really enjoy writing it, though, so no regrets there. Anyway, I just wanted to reflect on one thing that Dom was saying there, which is about the legal quandaries that intelligence services face when dealing with this kind of activity we've just been describing. And I remember when I was a student, I was invited to a talk given by the former head of MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove. And one thing he was very keen to emphasise in that talk was just quite how many legal decision makers, a any decision taken by the chief of the service has to go through in order for that to be given the green light. I mean, I think he even described how the next door office to his own were lawyers. 
And it just speaks, I think, to the gap between fiction, articulated perhaps by James Bond, and, uh, and the reality when it comes to this kind of activity. It is not a lawless world, that of the intelligence service. It's quite the opposite. And so it's important to remember that, I think, when we're talking about espionage. And of course, today we're obviously looking at examples of where Ukraine has been carrying out assassinations or seemingly carrying out assassinations. But they won't have done so without any legal contemplations of that. And certainly when we're dealing with countries like the UK, like America, and like I'm sure most Western countries, all Western countries most likely, there are major legal barriers in place. So anyone who expects there to be license to kill being handed out readily, uh, I'm afraid that that belongs on the cinema screen. Let's get back to Ukraine. Natalia Vasilyeva, our Russia correspondent, has written up a what feels like quite an important story about medical exemptions in the Ukrainian military. Dom Nichols, can you talk us through that? Yeah, so this is from our friend and colleague, uh, Natalia, so I can't claim any credit for whatsoever, although feel free to give me the credit if you want. And she's saying that Ukraine has clamped down on the number of medical exemptions it allows for men to avoid being called up to the army. So Kiev is no longer going to permit conscripts with mild mental disorders, HIV positive status or hepatitis to skip military service. We know President Zelensky has hit out at corruption in the exemption system and and elsewhere. Witnessed this week with um, the change in defence secretaries, although there's no suggestion Mr. Reznikov he himself was uh, was sanctioned for any any corruption. Uh, but in August, Mr. Zelensky did sack the heads of all the enlistment offices after a series of corruption scandals and compared their perceived, his word, cynicism and bribery, compared them to treason. So last week he announced a nationwide review of all medical exemptions issued since the start of the full-scale invasion. And uh, as well as that list I, I said earlier on, other conditions that have been cut from the list now uh, include treatable tuberculosis, slow-progressing blood disease and mild thyroid gland diseases. Um, Numbers, of course, are extremely difficult to come by, but we think that about 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed so far in this full-scale invasion, since the full-scale invasion. And Kiev's obviously stepped up recruitment efforts to, uh, you've got to keep you've got to keep people coming into service. So we do think that a significant number of Ukrainian men, well, they are believed to have fled the country illegally since last year and just last week the majority leader in the Ukrainian parliament said Kyiv might resort to asking neighbouring countries to help bring them back. Now that idea was quashed by Fedor Vanislavsky who's Mr Zelensky's representative in parliament. He said there are no legal grounds for what he described as a large-scale extradition of citizens but it is clearly a, a live issue. Now yesterday Ukraine's intelligence agency the SBU said it had foiled five separate criminal schemes in the west of the country to help draft dodgers. And they described some of these schemes in one of them, pretty, particularly elaborate. There was a criminal gang in the northwest city of uh, Rivna who'd set up a shell company that posed as an agricultural exporter. And then um, draft dodgers would be able to get exemptions to travel as the company's managers, saying they needed to go abroad for high-level talks about grain and so on and so forth. Then in also in the west, in Ternopil, an employee of the local enlistment office who is responsible, well, sorry, he's in that responsible for getting people into service. He was charging about fifteen hundred pounds, so I don't know what that is in dollars, two thousand dollars, US dollars, to uh, for people to avoid getting conscripted because he said he would he'd be able to enrol them in a college, which confers exemptions. And then in, elsewhere in the uh, in the west of the country, police arrested two local men who would shuttle draft dodgers across the Carpathian mountains to Romania in all-terrain vehicles, bypassing border control. So there are a number of schemes. They are being clamped down. All suspects face up to nine years in prison if, if convicted, but it is, a, it is a real issue and part of an ongoing, ongoing drive against, against corruption more generally. Thank you very much, Dom and Francis. If we've got no more updates or stories, let's move to our final thoughts then. Francis Turnley. Thanks, David. Obviously, next week we will be in the United States. And I just wanted to say on behalf of the whole team, a profound thank you to all of our listeners in the US who have reached out to us. Some of you have offered you offered us use of your homes. Others have shared very personal stories about your connection to the war and why you listen. We have a very interesting lineup of people we'll be interviewing out there and in places where we will be going 
the, na- the, the podcast will feel a little bit different next week, but hopefully in a good way. But as I say, I just wanted to say thank you all very much for that. And if we haven't managed to reply to you, I apologise, but we would like to one day. It remains a constant frustration for us that we can't reply to all of those listeners around the world who write in individually. I have a very long list of those I'm hoping to work through at some point. But as we always say, we do read every message and it's factored into our reporting. And in that vein, I'd like to read an email from one listener to close today. I've wanted to share this one for a while. I have changed the names and specific locations at their request. I had the privilege to grow up next to a Ukrainian refugee couple from the Second World War. The lady is 87 and still alive, living next door to my mother. Andre had witnessed his father shot dead by the Germans and his grandfather had already been shot by the Russians. Katerina was a survivor, along with her mother and three brothers of the Battle of Berlin. Both were lucky to be on the American side and resettled in Australia, where they met through the Ukrainian community and late in life they married. No children. I remember their magnificent wedding in a Ukrainian church in Melbourne with gold crowns. To a child, it was amazing. Andre died some years ago after a safe and lovely life working for the Australian Army as a mechanic. Sitting on the front porch with my father showing a bottle of beer often. On the last year of his life, my mother declared that he was not himself. He turned funny. I suggested that when death prepares you, it often takes you back into the past, and I could only imagine the demons lying there. Last week I visited my mother, and of course I had a cup of tea with Katerina. After a blackout last month, I bought them both a battery hurricane lamp each. She sat next to me, and I mentioned the war, as I do. She appreciates that I care. I explain the good people of the world care, and it touches her. This time... She welled up with tears. She said, it's all just like Stalin. No different. Putin is Stalin. He's smashing everything up. And who is going to build it back? Who? The pain in her eyes was haunting. The legacy for all Russians, the good, the bad and the ugly, is going to be monumental. The world will take a long time to move on. So thank you very much for that and to all of you who write in to share such personal accounts. For as long as you do, we'll continue to read them. Thank you very much, Francis Sternley. And to finish today, Dom Nichols. Yeah, thanks, David. So I've I've shelved my planned final thought because I was a bit caught out earlier on when you asked me about the animals in war and sniffer dogs and what have you. And I was trying to remember the man who died on my tour in Afghanistan who was a dog handler with a military working dog unit killed in Afghanistan and it it just struck me that uh, I could see his face and I momentarily could not remember his name and that was wrong of me so I just wanted to say Lance Corporal Liam Tasker who was killed in Afghanistan 2011 March the 1st 2011 we remember you and I'm sorry I momentarily forgot your name but uh, I won't allow that to happen again and yeah Liam Lance Corporal Tasker was killed. He was engaged by the Taliban. He suffered gunshot injuries and he later died of his wounds. And his dog, Theo, we got them back to Bastion. Corporal Tasker died of his injuries. And Theo suffered a seizure. The dog suffered a seizure, had a heart attack and died the next day. So I was talking earlier on about the bond between people and their animals. And I'm, I'm sorry I momentarily forgot your name. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. 
You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.